Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Friday, July 10th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Zion, Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Acts chapter 14, verse 19, 19 through chapter 15, verse 5. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God, to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And there remained no little time with the disciples. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to complete to keep the law of Moses. This New Testament reading will continue on Monday. Uh, this section is called the Council of Jerusalem. This is the first uh, ecumenical council of the church, like you've heard of the Council of Nicaea or in our own era, uh, Vatican II. Those were all ecumenical councils. This is the very first one, and we just heard the very, very beginning of it tonight. We'll hear uh, most of the rest of it on Monday evening. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is a continuation of the Small Called Articles, uh, picking up at the end of Article 2, uh, where we were hearing of uh, the Mass and what was wrong with what the Church had done with the Mass. And we will hear the end of that, and then we will hear about Invocation of the Saints, uh, monasteries and the papacy uh, not as long a reading as it was uh, the other night 
So we'll pick up at the end of what we said last time, talking about uh, the Mass. And it said that God's Word shall establish articles of faith, and no one else, not even an angel, can do so, Galatians 1.8. Second, following these things, evil spirits have produced many wicked tricks by appearing as the souls of the departed, and with unspeakable lies and tricks demanded masses, vigils, pilgrimages, and other alms. All of this we were expected to receive as articles of faith and to live accordingly. The Pope confirmed these things as he did the Mass and all other abominations. Here too there must be no yielding or surrendering. Third, pilgrimages. Here too the forgiveness of sins and God's grace were sought, for the Mass controlled everything. Pilgrimages, without God's word, have not been commanded, nor are they necessary, since the soul can be cared for in a better way. These pilgrimages can be abandoned without any sin and danger. So why do they leave behind their own callings, their parishes, their pastors, God's word, their wives, their children, and such? These are ordained and commanded. Instead, they run after these unnecessary, uncertain, dangerous illusions of the devil. Perhaps the devil has been writing the Pope, causing him to praise and establish these practices. By them, the people again and again revolted from Christ to their own works, and worst of all, became idolaters. Furthermore, pilgrimages are neither necessary nor commanded, but are senseless, doubtful, and harmful. On this, too, there can be no yielding or surrendering. Let it be preached that pilgrimages are not necessary but dangerous, and then see what will happen to them. Fourth, monastic societies, monasteries, foundations, and representatives have assigned and transferred by a legal contract and sale all masses, good works, and such, both for the living and the dead. This is nothing but a human trick, without God's word and entirely unnecessary and not commanded. It is also contrary to the chief article on redemption. Therefore, it cannot in any way be tolerated. Fifth, relics. So many falsehoods and such foolishness are found in the bones of dogs and horses that even the devil has laughed at such swindles. Relics should have been condemned long time ago, even if there were some good in them and all the more because they are without God's word. Since they are neither commanded nor counseled, relics are entirely unnecessary and useless. Worst of all, these relics have been imagined to cause indulgence and the forgiveness of sins. People have revered them as a good work in service of God like the Mass and other such practices. Sixth, here belong the precious indulgences granted, but only for money, both to the living and the dead. By indulgences, the miserable Judas, or Pope, has sold Christ's merits, along with the extra merits of all saints, of the entire church, and such things. All these things are unbearable. They are not only without God's word, are unnecessary and not commanded, but are against the chief article. For Christ's merit is obtained not by our works or pennies, but from grace through faith without money and merit. It is offered not through the Pope's power, but through the preaching of God's word. The Invocation of Saints the invocation of saints is also one of the Antichrist's abuses and conflicts with the chief article and destroys knowledge of Christ, Philippians 3.8. It is neither commanded nor counseled, nor has it any warrant in Scripture. Even if it were a precious thing, which it is not, we have everything a thousand times better in Christ. The angels in heaven pray for us, as does Christ himself, Romans 8.34. So did the saints on earth, and perhaps also in heaven, Revelation 6, 9-10. It does not follow, though, that we should invoke and adore the angels and saints, Revelation 22, 8-9. Nor should we fast, hold festivals, celebrate mass, make offerings, and establish churches, altars, and divine worship in their honor. Nor should we serve them in other ways or regard them as helpers in time of need. Nor should we divide different kinds of help among them, ascribing to each one a particular form of assistance, as the papists teach and do. This is idolatry. Such honor belongs to God alone. Uh, just a quick uh, example. For example, even today, uh, you would purchase a statue of St. Joseph, and you would bury him headfirst upside down in the ground of your house if you're trying to sell your house. And that would uh, motivate... St. Joseph to uh, 
pray for your house to sell, I guess. And there's various other uh, traditions and superstitions and things like that uh, out there uh, still to this day. As a Christian and saint upon earth, you can pray for me in many necessities, but this does not mean that I have to adore and call upon you. I do not need to celebrate festivals, fast, make sacrifices, or hold masses for your honor. I do not have to put my faith in you for my salvation. I can honor, love, and thank you in Christ in other ways. If such idolatrous honor were withdrawn from angels and departed saints, the remaining honor would be harmless and quickly forgotten. When advantage and assistance, both bodily and spiritual, are no longer expected, the saints will not be troubled, neither in their graves nor in heaven. No one will much remember or esteem or honor them without a reward or just out of pure love. In short, we cannot tolerate the Mass or anything that proceeds from it or is attached to it. We have to condemn the Mass in order to keep the Holy Sacrament pure and certain, according to Christ's institution, used and received through faith. Article 3. Chapters and Cloisters Reflecting on his own experiences as a monk, Luther rejects the Roman system of monastic life by making monasticism meritorious for eternal life, Rome contradicted the chief article of the Christian faith. Monasteries were originally founded as institutions of education. Luther advocates returning them to that noble purpose, otherwise they should be destroyed. Monastic chapters and cloisters were formerly founded with the good intention of educating learned men and virtuous women. They should be used for that again. They could produce pastors, preachers, and other ministers for the churches, they could also produce essential personnel for the secular government in cities and countries, as well as well-educated young women for mothers, housekeepers, and such. If these institutions will not serve this purpose, it is better to abandon them or tear them down than have their blasphemous, humanly invented services regarded as something better than ordinary Christian life and the offices and callings ordained by God. This, too, is contrary to the chief article on the redemption through Jesus Christ. Like all other human inventions, these religious institutions have not been commanded. They are needless and useless. They are also occasions for dangerous annoyances and empty works. See Isaiah 29.20. What the Hebrew prophets called avon, i.e. pain and labor. Article 4, the Papacy. This article contains the most vigorous rejection of the papacy in the Book of Concord. Luther flatly asserts that the Pope is truly the Antichrist, a statement that may sound outrageous to most modern ears. The Bishop of Rome is no more than a pastor of God's people in Rome and of all those who voluntarily attach themselves to him. He is nothing more than this. The institution of the papacy developed on the basis of false claims excuse me, to an authority that Christ has never bestowed. Luther points out how the papacy as it existed in his time did not exist for nearly 500 years in the West and never was received by the Eastern Church, that would be the Greek Orthodox Church. Luther's harsh words about the papacy are motivated by his passion for the chief article of the Christian faith, salvation by God's grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone. The Roman papacy in Luther's day was engaged not only in spiritual warfare against the truth of the scripture regarding Christ, but it also took up armor to kill and destroy those who adhere faithlessly to the article of justification. Today, the papacy continues to insist that salvation is not by grace alone, through faith alone, and thus continues to set itself against the central teaching of the Christian faith. Melanchthon has much more to say about this point in the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope, which we will look at after we finish the small called articles. Article 4, the Papacy. The Pope is not, according to the divine law or God's word, the head of all Christendom. This name belongs to one only, whose name is Jesus Christ. The Pope is only the bishop and pastor of the Church at Rome and of those who have attached themselves to him voluntarily or through a human agency such as a political ruler. Christians are not under him as a lord. They are with him as brethren and companions as the ancient councils in the age of St. Cyprian show. Today, though, none of the bishops dare to address the Pope as brother, as was done in the time of Cyprian. 
Even kings or emperors have to call him Most Gracious Lord. We will not, cannot, and must not approve this arrogance with a good conscience. Whoever wants to can do it without us. It follows that all the Pope has done and undertaken from such false, mischievous, and blasphemous, and arrogant power are devilish affairs and transactions. With the exception of what relates to the secular government, where God often allows much good to be done for a people, even through a tyrant and scoundrel. The Pope does this all for the ruin of the entire Holy Christian Church, so far as it is in his power, and for the destruction of the chief article about the redemption made through Jesus Christ. For there stand all the Pope's bulls and books. He roars like a lion in them, as the angel in Revelation 12 depicts him, crying out that no Christian can be saved without obeying him and being subject to him in all that he wishes, says, and does. All of this amounts to nothing less than this. Although you believe in Christ and have in him alone everything you need for salvation, yet it is nothing and all in vain unless you regard me as your God and be subject and obedient to me. It is clear that the Holy Church has been without the Pope for over 500 years at least. To this day, the churches of the Greeks and of many other languages neither have been nor are presently under the Pope. Besides, as has often been remarked, the papacy is a human invention that is not commanded and is not necessary but useless. The Holy Christian Church can exist very well without such a head. It would certainly have remained purer if such a head had not been raised up by the devil. The papacy is also of no use in the church because it exercises no Christian office. Therefore, it is necessary for the church to continue and to exist without the Pope. Suppose that the Pope would yield this point, he would not be supreme by divine right or from God's command, but just because we need a head, to whom all the rest cling in order to preserve the unity of Christians against sects and heretics. Suppose that such a head were chosen, and that people had the choice and the power to change or remove this head. The Council of Constance nearly adopted this discourse with reference to the popes deposing three and electing a fourth. Suppose I say that the Pope and the See at Rome would yield and accept this, though that is impossible, for then he would have to let his entire realm and estate be overthrown and destroyed, with all his rights and books which, to put it briefly, he cannot do. Nevertheless, even if this were done, Christianity would not be helped, but many more sects would arise than before. People would have to be subject to this head, not from God's command, but from their personal good pleasure. Such a head would easily and in a short time be despised and finally not have any members. The head would not have to be forever confined to Rome or any other place. It might be wherever and in whatever church God would grant a man fit for the office. Oh, how complicated and confused that would be. The church can never be better governed and preserved than if we all live under one head, Christ. All the bishops should be equal in office, although they may be unequal in gifts. They should be diligently joined in unity of doctrine, faith, sacraments, prayer, works of love, and such. According to St. Jerome, this is how the priests at Alexandria governed the churches, together and in common. So did the apostles, and afterward all bishops throughout all Christendom, until the Pope raised his head above all. This teaching shows forcefully that the Pope is the true end Christ or Antichrist, 1 John 2.18. He has exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ, for he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which nevertheless is nothing, and is neither ordained nor commanded by God. This is, properly speaking, how he exalts himself against every so-called God, as Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Even the Turks or the Tartars, great enemies of Christians as they are, do not do this. They take bodily tribute and obedience from Christians, but they allow whoever wishes to believe in Christ. The Pope, however, bans this faith. He says that to be saved, a person must obey him. This we are unwilling to do, even though we must die in God's name because of this. This all proceeds from the Pope wishing to be called the supreme head of the Christian Church by divine right. So he had to make himself equal and superior to Christ. He had to have himself proclaimed the head and then the Lord of the Church, and finally of the whole world. This makes him simply God on earth to the point that he has dared to issue commands even to the angels in heaven. When we distinguish the Pope's teaching from or compare it to Holy Scripture, it is clear that the Pope's teaching at its best 
has been taken from the imperial and heathen law. It deals with political matters and decisions or rights, as the decretal show. His law also teaches ceremonies about churches, garments, food, persons, and childish, theatrical, and comical things without measure. But in all of this, nothing at all is taught about Christ, faith, and God's commandments. Finally, the papacy is nothing else than the devil himself, because above and against God, the Pope pushes his falsehoods about masses, purgatory, the monastic life, one's own works, and false worship. This, in fact, is the papacy. He also condemns, murders, and tortures all Christians who do not exalt and honor his abominations above all things. Therefore, just as we cannot worship the devil himself as Lord and God, so we cannot endure his apostle, the Pope, or Antichrist, in his rule as head or Lord. For what his papal government really consists of, as I have very clearly shown in many books, is to lie and kill and destroy body and soul eternally. They will have enough to condemn in the council in these four articles, for they cannot and will not concede to us even the least point in one of these articles. Of this we can be certain. We must be sure and consider the hope that Christ our Lord has attacked his adversary. He will press and attack him both by his spirit and his coming. Amen. In the council, we will not stand before the emperor or the political ruler as at Augsburg, when the emperor published a most gracious edict and caused matters to be heard kindly. Instead, we will appear before the pope and the devil himself who intends to listen to nothing, but who will just condemn murder and force us to idolatry. Therefore, we should not here kiss his feet or say, You are my gracious Lord. Rather, we should say, as the angel of the Lord in Zechariah 3.2 said to the devil, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Yeah, and that is some of Luther at his absolute best. Uh, he doesn't miss, mince words. Uh, it's going to go on like that in the rest of the articles because it is a very forceful confession against uh, the way the church was, uh, but it also does graciously fill out and, and explore all of our doctrines of faith, uh, showing us from Scripture where they come from. So, a little bit of harsh language there, but they had to be in those times. Um, is all of that still true today? Uh, a lot of it is. A lot of it is. Uh, the Pope is no longer a secular ruler. That's the one thing that's changed. He's no longer an arm, uh, a general over his army. And we can talk about that at another time. But, but we will continue reading the uh, Small Call articles on Monday. And now we confess the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as always, our Friday prayer focuses on our Lord's passion. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you, that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep are your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth. And there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel, 
from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin you were counted a sinner, and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit so that you could pay our debt and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Lord and giver of all good things, the same powers that crucified Christ persecuted Paul as he bore on his body the marks of Jesus for preaching Christ crucified. Give us faith to believe that no matter what suffering we endure for the sake of Christ, it is all gift and it is all good, so that with Paul we may rejoice in suffering as we bear on our bodies the marks of Jesus, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night. <laughs>